This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Well, welcome back to the uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. I've had a bit of a break from it, and it's uh, good to be back. And uh, I hope we will have a good uh, season. Uh, and in, in, in a way, of course, this is rather a terrible historical moment uh, in which uh, war threatens and all kinds of other horrible, horrible things uh, are likely to happen. But uh, uh, the best we can do is to try to keep these podcasts going and keep some of the ideas flowing from out of them in the hope that we can put them to work, uh, creating rather a better world. And the better world that uh, I would think of is one where the question of technology and what technology is about looms rather large. So I thought I'd start off this uh, season with a couple of sessions on technology. And uh, I'm not the world's expert on this. I just want to make some very general arguments and uh, to sort of uh, do some uh, thought-provoking uh, on this uh, on this topic, and I want to begin with uh, what Marx and uh, Engels said in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, now, in fact, of course, this is largely Marx. Uh, he apparently wrote most of it. Uh, Engels has his name on it. So, if I say Marx, well, it's also it's really Marx and Engels, except that Engels was a bit of a sleeping partner in it. In the middle of uh, the first part of the Communist Manifesto, uh, they write as follows. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all our earlier ones. All fixed, fast-frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can, un- before they can ossify. A man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. And they go on in this vein for several pages. Uh, these are rather wonderful moments in the Communist Manifesto. The prose is very sharp, the messaging very clear, and uh, it's just fantastic stuff to read and to, to think about. Um, but there is an, always an interesting question when Marx is making these assertions as to to what degree there is evidence for what, is he say, what he's saying. Uh, Yes, he was living in a period of uh, rapid technological change, and it's understandable that he would talk about it, but it could have been episodic just to that period, and the Industrial Revolution having been over, everything could have gone settled quietly in its place. But but Marx suggests that that's not in the nature of capitalism. And one of the things that he does throughout his writings is to try to establish what is the nature of capitalism, what is capital all about, and what is its political economy all about? And this passage suggests that one of the key features of the political economy will be perpetual revolutionary transformation in technologies. Now, in capital, what Marx does is to explain why this is the case, because there are many features of this perpetual technological dynamism, this perpetual disturbance and upsetting of all old-fashioned relations, there are certain features of that which are not very comfortable to live with. And therefore, you would thought that uh, society would have found ways to evade them or avoid them or modify them and mitigate them in some way. Uh, because they're not, you know, technological, technological change is not all good. It's uh, a mixture of goods and bads, and we'll see how uh, that works out in, in, in a minute. So Marx then sets this out. Now, in Capital, he sets out to explain why the, uh, and where the technological dynamism comes from. And this is laid out in his construction of what is called relative surplus value. 
Now, Marx's argument is that capitalists are all of, driven by the profit motive. The profit is, is obvious, but that is what they're after and that is what they need. And therefore, profitability is at the center of uh, what, it, what they're about. And in the theory of uh, r relative surplus value, Marx suggests that profitability is going to be dependent upon technological advantage. In other words, if many capitalists are sitting down and trying to um, you know, produce something, the, the technology with which they produce it has a big effect upon the profitability that they gain. In other words, if the average price of a commodity in society is fixed at a certain level, a given level of, of technology, uh, then if I have a technology which is much more advanced, I can sell at the social price and produce at much lower cost. And therefore, there's a gap between what I have to utilize to produce and what on the average is being utilized to produce. And that gap gives me relative surplus value. In other words, if something on average costs 10 units and I can produce uh, in such a way that I can do it in eight units, uh, then I'll get two units uh, extra, uh, uh, extra profit. And it's this extra profit that drives individual capitalists. Now, what happens is this, that individual capitalists driven by this profit motive are going to adopt a superior technology. And as they develop a superior technology, they get excess profits. At the same time, the people who have the, uh, the, the, the least in the way of technological advantage uh, will be losing a certain amount. And there will come a point uh, where those with inferior technologies will not be able to produce anymore because the average price will go down as, new, as everybody adopts a new technology. And if you still keep with the old technology, you won't be able to make the average price and you're driven out of business. So uh, there's a positive incentive to engage in technological change, which is that it puts you ahead of the pack and you get extra profit. And there's, an, there's, if you like, a, a negative side to it, which says if you don't engage in technological change, in the end, you're going to be driven out of business. So this then is, if you like, it, uh, lies at the heart of Marx's theory of relative surplus value. It's, it's competition between individual capitalists in a particular field of uh, production. And in that field, the, the best technology is the one which is going to yield you extra profit. And the worst technology is going to lead you in the end, to, to, to be driven out of business. Now, if this was all there was to the story, then there would be a, a, a kind of a, a end game very quickly uh, to this. But it's not the end of the story, because uh, the new technologies are going to produce goods at lower cost. And therefore, the individual price of those goods is going to be dri driven down. In other words, if I have a uh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm making uh, shirts with a hand loom, uh, the, the, the price is going to be very re relatively high. If I make them with power looms, I'm, the price for, is going to be relatively low. And because the price is, is, is coming down, Marx points out that the productivity of labor is going to increase with this drive towards technological advantage. And as the productivity of labor increases, so the cost of commodities comes down. And as the cost of commodities come down, so those commodities become accessible to more and more people in the population, uh, even with, uh, uh, without them increasing, increasing their wages. So the social productivity of labor then is, very, is a product of this pursuit of relative surplus value. And if that social productivity of labor uh, captures onto the, the products which workers need in, in order to survive, then workers themselves will be uh, able to uh, gain more in the way of commodities. Or the other way around, capitalists can actually reduce wages, even though the, the cost of living uh, is, is, is coming, coming down. They can reduce wages in, consistent with that. And in, in reducing wages, uh, they can actually gain more surplus value. Uh, let, me, let me put it in, 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 in terms of uh, a particular case of this, which was not technological change. It was actually a change of public policy. Uh, when Marx was writing, uh, 
there were in England uh, something called corn laws, which were actually uh, tariffs on wheat. And the tariffs on wheat were important because that was where the profitability of the landed aristocracy came from. They, they could rent out their land, people would produce the wheat, uh, but the wheat had to be at a certain cost in order to pay the rents uh, which uh, that population needed. So the Corn Laws kept the, 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 the price, price of wheat high, which meant the price of, of, of flour was high, which meant the price of bread was high. Now, bread is a basic commodity, of course, and so with a high price of bread, uh, you, you, you find uh, that you have to pay adequate wages uh, to, to meet that high price of bread. Now, the, the, the industrial interest in what was known as the Manchester School, Manchester School at the time didn't like these Corn Laws, and they fought to get the, uh, the abolition of the Corn Laws. Uh, obviously, the landed aristocracy fought them, and there was a big fight in Parliament over this, but in the end, the Corn Laws were repealed. And they were in part repealed because the industrialists had said to the workers, wouldn't you like cheaper bread? And the workers said, yeah, of course. And so the workers were supporting the industrialists in this campaign to get rid of the Corn Laws. And as you got rid of the Corn Laws, so the price of bread came down. And because the price of bread came down, and bread was a necessity for the working people, the, the industrialists could turn around and actually decrease the wages. So, and because the, the wages decreased, uh, that meant there was extra puff profit for the industrialists. So the industrialists were gaining in profit by reducing wages because the Corn Laws had been repealed. Now, this is a, the same thing happens with technological advantage. If bread is all that is, is produced and the technology of making bread improves so that loaves become much cheaper, then you can reduce wages uh, and uh, the, the workers will still get the same amount of bread. Uh, and this then is, is, is if you like, uh, uh, another form of relative surplus value because this form of relative surplus value is available to all capitalists. Because when the price of bread goes down, all capitalists can reduce the, the level of wages, all capitalists are going to get excess profit. So this is the theory of relative surplus value as Marx develops it. The individual theory of relative surplus value is individuals getting a superior technology and technological advantage. Uh, the social theory is this business of uh, the value of labor power goes down because the value of the goods which the ne labor needs to survive diminishes because the social productivity of labor is rising. So this is, if you like, the story. Now, in the first instance, one of the things that happens is that if I get the superior technology, uh, somebody's going to look over my, my shoulder and say, oh, that's a superior technology. Uh, and then they think they will adopt the super, superior technology. And somebody else will come along and look at these two superior technologies and say, well, I can actually come up with an even more superior technology. So you get a phenomena out of this intercapitalist uh, inter competition of what you might call leapfrogging innovations, that everybody is out to try to create and, 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 and live through a, a, a technological advantage. And leapfrogging innovations mean that uh, the dynamism uh, of technological change just gets going further and further and further and faster and faster and faster. And you get leapfrogging going on that uh, I have a superior technology today, somebody comes along and develops an even more superior one, leapfrogs over me, and I find I have to take their technology to catch up. Meanwhile, other people have to catch up to a leapfrogging kind of process. And Marx kind of says, this is where the technological dynamism comes from. This is why a capitalist society is inherently, by nature, technologically dynamic. And the technological dynamism, therefore, is a continuing feature of a capitalist economy. And there is really no way <clears throat> you, you can really keep it uh, repressed. Though, of course, there are some situations in, in which uh, monopoly power is such that it uh, actually prevents uh, this leads leapfrogging uh, sort of innovations going on. Because the mechanism that is important, and this is an important phrase that I'm going to use, the mechanism which goes on, which pushes the, the technological dynamism, is what Marx calls the coercive laws of competition. Now, the coercive laws of competition, then, are foundational for 
creating this leapfrogging innovation and all this technological dynamism. If uh, there are no coercive laws of, cop of, of competition operating, then you won't get the technological dynamism, which is one of the reasons why we have sort of uh, lots of laws against monopoly power, uh, supposedly against monopoly power. Though most monopolies also understand that they have a, an obligation to try to uh, develop uh, superior technologies anyway, for reasons which we'll talk about uh, 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 later on. But that the, the coercive laws of competition then operate in, in, in a sophisticated capitalist society in such a way as to enforce technological dynamism. Now one of the things Marx does at a certain point is just to say, look, all of us live in this society. We like to think we have individual choices, but in fact we are a lot of us and even the capitalists are driven by abstractions. And the abstractions are enforced by the coercive laws of competition. So this is the nature of a capitalist society and, and is therefore, as, as I've suggested, this explains why there is this technological dynamism. Now, technological dynamism is on, it, it comes in various forms and I th it's important, I, I think, to, 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 to reflect just for a moment on what these forms are. Firstly, there is what you might call the organizational form. Now, this is not technology in the narrow sense. This is technology in the, in the broader sense. That the organization of cooperation, for example, the organization of divisions of labor, uh, and so on, um, these, these organizational forms are such as to improve social productivity. So if I'm in competition with you, and you're employing you know, 20 laborers, if I can employ 100 laborers and develop a cooperative structure within them, I can probably outproduce you simply by the fact of my superior organizational form and the superior number of laborers I can employ with that uh, organizational form. So organizational form is terribly important. And we'll, we'll see a lot of that in the literature, of course, because there's a lot of consulting goes on about you know, ways in which you can organize your labor process so that it becomes more uh, productive, uh, how the productivity of labor can be shifted through the transformation of these organizational forms. And these organizational forms, well, some of them are internal to, to, the, uh, to, to, to the firm, but there are others which arise, uh, organizational forms of, of, of firms collaborating with each other. Uh, I'll give you one organizational form which was terribly important in the 1980s in the automobile industry, which is something called the, the just-in-time production system. And what the just-in-time production system was, uh, was about was saying, well, okay, you're, made, you're, 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 you're producing an automobile. The automobile needs wheels and tires and, and uh, seats and, uh, and, and, and all, those, all those other things, and of course a motor and so on. All of these are produced somewhere else. And you've got to have enough on hand to make your automobile. If you're making the automobile and everything is there except the, except the engine or except the wheels, everything holds up. So what they did was to develop an automated system, a just-in-time system, which meant that you didn't have to have a vast stock of wheels and tires and so on. You had them delivered into the factory at exactly the rate that was required so that all of the cars that were going to produce that day you had, there was enough wheels for all of them. But by reducing the inventory, you were actually saving a lot of money because that's dead labor out there when you've got a big stock of wheels sitting there sort of being unused. So the just-in-time system set up uh, a flow chart, as it were, that the assembly of the automobile was occurring here. The parts were coming in, in at the rate at which it was required for the daily production, so you reduced the inventory a great deal. And this saved a lot of money and made, uh, made for a much higher profit in the automobile industry as a result of the just-in-time system. Now, this didn't involve any, any, any new machinery or anything that kind. What it, it, what it did involve, of course, was having, having a, eventually a computer expert and, 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 uh, and flow charts and all the rest of it. So it was an organizational form which improved productivity. So the, the, the second form of uh, a change affecting the uh, social, the, the productivity of uh, labor, uh, the simplest way to look at it is simply to say 
but happy laborers tend to produce more easily and more fluently and, uh, and more productively than do re recalcitrant and angry laborers. So again, in the automobile industry in the 1980s, they set up certain quality circles, which gave a certain amount of uh, command to the workers themselves with the idea that this was going to make for uh, what was called ex-efficiency, a much greater efficiency uh, of labor because uh, labor was collaborative rather than antagonistic. Now, there are many ways in which uh, you can do this. Uh, you can uh, make people feel good. Uh, the Japanese do calisthenics every morning before they go into work and things of this sort. Uh, you know, so, so, but, but, but this is not to, be, not to be laughed at, actually, because when uh, workers are discontent, they are likely to cause accidents and they're likely to uh, throw sand in the works and various other things and not care about what is being done. The mistakes will pile up and so on. So uh, the, the, if, if, if you like, the, the, the sort of tone of, uh, of, the, of labor management and the neighbor relations and so on and how to keep your workers happy and, and contented and, and not rile them up, that becomes very, again, very important for, for, for the social productivity of labor. I'd like to say, well, okay, you have organizational form, you then have what might be called the software of production, which is all of this kind of uh, touchy-feely stuff, but which actually uh, does, uh, to some degree, work in, 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 in many workplaces. And the final version is, of course, the hardware of technological change. And that hardware are the machines uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, now, uh, obviously, when Marx was writing, machine technology was all the rage. Everybody was going on about machines. And so machines were, if you like, uh, considered uh, the, 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 what technological change was really focused upon. But if you go back to earlier periods, uh, what Marx called the manufacturing period of the 18th century, before the big machines came along and the, 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 uh, uh, the steam engine and all those kinds of things came along, it will, if, if we go back to that period, uh, then, then in fact it's organizational form and, and, and also the software, which is kind of absolutely crucial in, in early 18th century capitalist production. Uh, it started to become the machine stuff with the, the development of the, of the power loom and uh, other mechanical instruments. And in particular, of course, with the steam engine, then we get the hardware side of things. So those three areas are very, very significant historically, the hardware, the software, and the organizational form. And which you do and how you do it is obviously going to be dependent upon uh, you know, particular uh, situations. And, and, and of course, some, some firms survive on the basis of good labor relations. Uh, and even though their, their organizational form is not great, and even though their, their technology or their hardware is not that great, they still do very, very well because they have an excellent uh, labor relations. And so good labor relations uh, is not uh, irrelevant in, in, in all of this at all. So the technological dynamism then, when I talk about it, I'm talking about it in those three forms. And I know it sounds when I say technology like I'm emphasizing the hardware, but I think that what, what I want to do is to em emphasize that I'm not talking only about the hardware, I'm talking about the, the software and the organizational form. Now, one of the things that uh, has happened historically has been the social productivity of labor has uh, reduced uh, the, uh, the, the, the value of commodities. I mean, what it take, took to produce uh, a bolt of uh, cotton cloth by, by a hand loom versus for a power loom, that was a huge, huge difference. And what this meant was that, uh, of course, uh, fabrics became much, much cheaper, much, much, uh, uh, and therefore the market for, for fabrics had to, to uh, increase uh, in, in a way that was going to, going to follow, if you like, upon the improvements of, uh, 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 on improvements of technological change. So the, 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 the whole kind of story of technology, as it's told in Marx's Capital, is very much about the coercive laws of competition affecting the social productivity of labor which affects the value of labor power and enables you to pro drive it downwards at the same time as the coercive laws of competition force individual capitalists constantly to search out new 
technologies in order to gain technological advantage in profit making. So that is, if you like, uh, the story. And in Marx's time, you might say that was an adequate kind of story to tell. Um, I've often thought to myself, in our times, that's not quite enough. Yes, all, all of that which we talked about does go on, and therefore there will be technological dynamism come what might. But there is another form of technological dynamism which is very, very important, and which is, in some respects, perhaps even outgrown uh, the sort of nature of capital uh, technological dynamism that we've already described. But this, uh, this form of, uh, of technological change is uh, problematic for one very significant reason, and that is that in this case we're not looking at the coercive laws of competition uh, between uh, capitals. We're looking at the coercive laws of competition between states. In other words, instead of thinking about rivalries between firms, we talk about rivalries between states. Now, when did rivalries between states start to pick up? When was the state formed? Well, the states are formed kind of 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, in uh, 1648, there was something called the Treaty of Westphalia, which in Western Europe set up a situation where there was an agreement amongst everybody to uh, accept the sovereignty of the state and to accept the given borders of the state. So the Treaty of Westphalia basically said to all the European powers, OK, we've now got a fixed set of states. We all should acknowledge the, 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 the sovereignty of that state, and we should also respect the boundaries of that state. Now you can see uh, this is a very important, significant in, uh, situation right now because we have a country, Russia, which is not respecting uh, the borders of uh, Ukraine and which is not respecting the sovereignty of Ukraine. It is in violation, in a sense, of the Treaty of Westphalia. But here is something terribly important theoretically, which is to what degree is uh, competition between states somehow or other related, tightly related, to the competition between, between capitalists? And to what degree does the technological change, which comes about through the, the, through the competition between states, to what degree does that involve major, major forms of technological reconfiguration and, and what is it that, the relationship of that to the whole dynamics of, of capitalist uh, development. Now, there is a, a school of thought that says that the origin of capitalism depended upon an, the creation of an interstate system that many of the features of capitalism were widespread around the world. You can find them in Imperial China, you can find them in Ottoman uh, Empire, you can find them in the Mughal Empire and so on. But you never got capitalism coming out of it because capitalism was not uh, able to actually develop in the way it did. The only place in which it could develop in the way it did was where there was a vibrant interstate system. And that therefore, the interstate system in Western Europe was, if you like, the, the, the birthplace uh, of capitalism as we now know it. And it was this interstate system where interstate co coercion and, and, uh, and competition uh, was a very important feature. Now, what were they competing about? Well, they were competing about, of course, wealth and, and, and power. Uh, and to some degree, right to this day, we find the state uh, very much involved in trying to support high tech in such a way that uh, uh, the United States maintains its technological advantage in, uh, in artificial intelligence or in other areas. Uh, and uh, therefore, technological advantage is terribly important to the relative uh, wealth of, of, uh, and, uh, and well-being of, of the states themselves. So, yes, uh, what we will find is the, uh, the support of private industry and state support of private industry. So if you take something like pharmaceuticals, 
The pharmaceutical industry in this country rests very much upon money which is channeled to them from the states through uh, the National Institute of Health. And, and, and therefore the state is actually subsidizing technological development because it knows that if you have major drug companies which are in your midst, uh, then uh, you have a technological advantage as a country in terms of trading with the rest of the world. So yes, indeed, there is a direct way in which the state becomes involved in support of various forms of corporate capitalism. And we've seen, of course, those forms of cor corporate capitalism in agriculture. We've seen them in the United States. We've seen them in agriculture. We've seen them in energy. We've seen them in pharmaceuticals and, 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 and so on. So the state is heavily, heavily involved. And if you're a poor state, you can't, you can't do that. If you're Ecuador, you can't do that. If you're Bolivia, you can't do that. It's only a very rich state that can afford enough money to maintain its technological advantage. And technological advantage means that you get a super amount of uh, a surplus value flowing in to your country. So technological advantage is terribly important to the relative well-being of the population of the United States and the well-being of the, of the corporations that uh, work here within the United States. So, so technological advantage then is something which the state is, is obviously involved in. It was not so much involved in it directly uh, when Marx was writing. But what it was involved when Marx was writing was, of course, military equipment a military advantage. And here you find, of course, the coercive laws of competition working like a, like a dream. That if you have a missile gap, as everybody said there was in the 1960s, then of course you've got to work on missiles. When the Russians put up Sputnik, oh, the whole the United States is, is, goes, goes crazy. They, 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 want to, they, they need, need to do the same. The arms race is going on perpetually. And of course, in this country, after World War II, we find the emergence of this... Uh, horrible thing which people refer to as the military-industrial complex. And the military-industrial complex is, of course, chasing the, the, the money which exists so that, um, you know, Lockheed Martin and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and all of those people and the people making the tanks and the, and the, and the military hardware and so on. So there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of uh, 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 technological innovation, particularly on hardware and particularly in some sectors. And this, again, is something that's important to recognize. Aerospace, for example, yes, tremendous state influence. Uh, textiles and, and no, not so much, not so much. No, you might support them for, you know, political reasons, but you know, you're not, it's not as if uh, having a superior textile industry is somehow rather important for the United States relative to Bangladesh or relative to China. It, it's, it, it, it really is not. It's not as if you're going to subsidize your, your, your textiles and, and, and clothing sector. Uh, you might, you, uh, like I say, you might do it for political reasons, but you don't, you don't do it because, uh, because that's where your real advantage is coming. But aerospace, that's another question. Uh, the uh, uh, other other areas like, uh, of course, uh, uh, naval construction, uh, uh, engineering, uh, military equipment in general, internal combustion engines, and the capacities to move uh, large numbers of pop of of, sold of of military personnel around the world quickly. Those kinds of things. So, so what we'll find is that in this case. Uh, the important thing here is that the use value of these technologies is not that they produce goods which are good for the people, but use values which are going to allow you to compete militarily with somebody else. So you get the United States spending a vast amount of its uh, resources on military equipment. You now see China sort of pushing very hard. You see a lot of competition going on in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and, and of course, and electronics and all of those areas. And, and again, this has a lot to do with the, both the military advantage, uh, but, all, but also the economic uh, uh, advantage. If uh, when China started to come up with a, a phone company unlike Huawei, which was very, which was colonizing global markets, uh, the United States had to cut it down because that's not to its advantage and, and so on. So 
I think that it would be very interesting if, if Marx had actually added to this, you know, uh, the coercive laws of, of competition between uh, firms, the idea of internal, uh, the uh, coercive laws of competition between states. But in this instance, of course, we're, we're talking at something which many of us would regard as rather non-benevolent. Uh, but the, of course, there are some problems. Uh, non-benevolent defense activities <clears throat> and, and expenditures uh, can in fact produce things which can have a civilian use. This was, of course, the great story of uh, nuclear power. Nuclear power was developed in order to develop a, a nuclear bomb, which would give you, you know, a certain uh, military advantage. And the United States got there first, and the United States used it. And then, of course, the Russians got it. Initially, the United States developed it as fast as it could because it knew, knew the Germans were producing it as fast as it could. And the Germans were, of course, developing rocketry and so on, which uh, was a very interesting thing because after World War II, uh, the U.S. took all of the rocket scientists who were living in Germany and developing the, the German rockets and took them down into Florida and put them in NASA and, 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 and so on. So the technological, the, the story of, of, of global technological change is partly driven by the coercive laws of competition between uh, individual uh, firms and partly driven by increasingly the, uh, it, uh, the, the coercive laws of competition between states. Now, the trouble with this, co these coercive laws of competition between states was this, that states actually developed the superior technologies and then states actually started to use them. So interstate competition gave us two world wars. I mean, the framework that set up World War I, the framework that set up World War II, was interstate competition within Europe. So interstate competition within Europe was very good in terms of driving new technologies and new technological breakthroughs all over the place. And World War II was fantastic for the development of new technologies, radar and, 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 and medical technologies as, 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 as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So, so if you kind of said, look, look at the whole uh, cornucopia of new technologies and where they've come from. And post-1945, you would say, well, the war was a huge place, but a terrible thing that's happening, but it is having this positive impact of all of these technological innovations that are coming out of it. And those technological innovations are very, very critical. So this led into, by the way, uh, uh, just as this is a bit of a sidebar on this, this led into uh, the, 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 the idea after World War II of everybody in their right mind saying basically this interstate competition in Europe has got to stop. Interstate competition in Europe has given us two world wars. And people in the United States were particularly kind of fed up in the sense of saying, look, we got dragged into two world wars because of interstate competition. Though in the United States, of course, the, part of the interstate competition was between the United States and, and, and Japan. But, but one of the things that politically that happened after World War II was a real drive on the part of the Europeans themselves, backed very, very, very strongly by US power, to try to create institutions and structures in Europe that would prevent there ever being interstate competition of the sort that had created two world wars. So you get uh, the, the, the common market, you get the European Union, you get the Euro, you get, you know, uh, NATO and all the rest of it. So you get a, 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 a kind of a, 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 an attempt to curb the power of interstate competition. Now, this doesn't mean that the European states are, are still not competitive with each other. But what it does mean is that they are competitive over different things. They may be competitive over soccer. They may be develop, uh, competitive over the social model they, they set up, and there's a good deal of signs of that. They may be competitive culturally and so on. And, and, and so it's not as if competition entirely disappears. But uh, the, the, the whole impact of the, of the post-war uh, agreement after 1945 was to somehow or other 
make sure that interstate competition in Europe did not produce two new, two more world world wars, which led into, if you like, the idea that interstate competition was going to be less fierce on the military equipment front. But military equipment front uh, recurs because the Cold War was very much about that, and and so we we find we find uh, much of the technological change driven by by Cold War concerns after 1945, and now, of course, driven by competition with China. Uh, and we, we now we see the interstate competition is no longer between states, it's between power blocks, between the Chinese power block, uh, between the European power block, uh, between Russia and, and the United States. So that what, what, what we're seeing is, 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 is competition of this sort, which is, again, pushed very hard into uh, the new technologies, and you look at the new technologies that have uh, arisen out of uh, military concerns over the past 30 or 40 years, the internet being the, the paradigmatic one, and, 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 and you see a process of this sort. Now, how can we actually corral this drive to technological change? Clearly, all the time we have intensity of competition between states, or between power blocks, we're going to get uh, arms races going on all of the time. And those arms races produce some positive impacts, no question, in terms of new technologies, but also their primary use value is negative, which is the ability to go to war. And one of the things that Marx did, which was a very interesting kind of comment, was to say, you know, look, one of the ways in which capital destroys its surplus capital is by going to war. And he likened going to war to the equivalent of taking as much value as is surplus to requirements right now and dumping it in the ocean. That's the image he used. And if you've got over accumulation of capital, then one of the ways you can deal with that is through kind of the military industrial complex will soak it up for you because that is really un pretty unproductive expenditures in terms of the well-being of people, even though it does create employment, does create create. Uh, certain demands for kinds kinds of things, so it's it's a very important sector of uh, of the economy. So th these th the, the the coercive laws are, are are problematic, and one of the things it would seem to me that we have to think about is well, in what ways can we keep some level of of pressure on for towards technological innovation, which is outside of these what seem to me very, very, very non-benign forms of competition for military advantage, for wealth and power, and 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 corralling wealth and power and and all the rest of it, and and for corporations uh, uh, using their their technological know-how as as a means of monopoly control, but that is another story which I will deal with next time. But. Here is, here is the situation in which technological dynamism is with us. We're not going to be able to do anything about it unless we confront the coercive laws of competition between firms and the coercive laws of competition between states and be, or between power blocks. And those are the two things which we should have in our head when we think about what might be a benign process of technological development as opposed to this rather a complicated uh, process of technology, which is primarily about the use value of, 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 of weapons of mass destruction. And, and at some point or other, the use of those weapons of mass destruction uh, is likely to occur, and that seems to me to be a huge danger that we ought to avert at its very root. And its very root lies in the coercive laws of competition and their effect upon technological dynamism. With that, and we'll wait until next time. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.